My name is Dr. Yasha Luzak, and I'm an associate professor at the University of Exeter Law School. My research field is consumer protection. And in this short talk, I would like to present to you not only the results of my recent research project, but also have you think about the following. We are all consumers. We conclude transactions as consumers every day. We conclude a transaction as a consumer if we conclude a transaction for private purposes, for purposes not related to our profession or business. Thus, if you watch a movie on Netflix, you're watching it as a consumer. If I use my phone to post something on TikTok or Reddit or Instagram, I'm posting it as a consumer. As consumers, we have rights. But do you know your consumer rights? Would you know when and how to enforce them? The first step in learning about consumer protection is to study what consumer rights are there and how consumers can enforce them. However, I believe that it is my task as a scholar in this field not only to educate my students about what rights consumers have, but also to challenge them to critically assess these rights. And that brings me to the last question on this slide. We need to think about what consumers actually gain from consumer protection measures. And more broadly speaking, we should think about whether consumer protection measures are effective. I tried to answer some of these questions in one of my recent research projects, where I looked into the protection that consumers are offered when they use services provided by digital service providers. This project was commissioned by the European Parliament and together with a colleague from the University of Amsterdam uh, in the Netherlands, Professor Marco Loss, we were asked to uh, do the following. To identify the terms and conditions, TNCs, of digital service providers, DSPs, that digital service providers commonly use when concluding contracts with users of their services. We were then asked to check whether these um, terms and conditions could potentially be unfair. And if they were unfair, to analyze whether the current protection framework was actually effective in protecting users of digital services against such unfair terms and conditions. Unfortunately, we have found that often this protection framework had gaps in it, was insufficient. And therefore, we thought of new ways to protect consumers against such unfair practices of digital service providers, and we made recommendations to that effect. Today, I would like to discuss with you one of such practices that are commonly used, and we consider them to be potentially unfair, and that is a practice of persuasion profiling. Now, persuasion profiling is actually a little bit more subtle than what you see portrayed here on this meme, but it is still a practice that aims to steer, frame, and maybe even limit consumption choices. Digital service providers may use automated decision-making to steer consumers in the online environment by disclosing to them offers um, only of specific providers or only specific offers, or by adjusting the order in which these offers are being disclosed. Personalized ranking of offers is quite a common commercial practice. Why? Because marketing studies actually show us that consumers have a short attention span and are more likely to click on a link um, that is being displayed to them first or at the top of search results. Therefore, digital service providers use um, the big data that they collect to entice consumers to pay attention to specific offers or offers of specific providers. I am quite convinced that you have been exposed to persuasion profiling, profiling already in your life. Why? Because let's look at Google, for example. Google adjusts its search and news results based on algorithms, which take into account not just um, neutral factors, but also individual characteristics of consumers. Thus, I put a random 
search term in Google, let's say a leather jacket, and I asked a friend of mine to do the same, and you can see that we received different results. My results are on the left, hers are on the right. Um, what is important here to note is that the results differ for each of us, because likely what they take into account is, for example, our location, our past purchase history, our past search history. So factors that are specific to each of us. Another example is Netflix. When me and my friends, again, at pretty much the same time, looked for recommendations of movies, we received completely different recommendations because Netflix learns which movies to recommend to us based, again, on our history of movie watching. They are not interested in recommending to us what is trending. They are interested in recommending to us what they think will make us stay and watch the movies with them use their services for longer. Persuasion profiling works best when it is invisible, when we don't know it is happening. Therefore, digital service providers may actually object to having to disclose to consumers that they use such practices. They will say it makes them less effective. But could we, or maybe we already do, um, have an obligation for digital service providers to actually disclose that they are using such practices to consumers in order to protect consumers more. Well, recently, in 2020, there was a new European Consumer Protection Measures adopted, Modernization Directive. And in this directive, there is a new prohibition for an unfair commercial practice that is a type of persuasion profiling. Namely, online traders will now not be allowed not to disclose to consumers that certain offers have been ranked better or higher in search results following the payment to that effect by another provider. Thus, if we go back, if we look at that previous slide of Google, we can see Google already adjusted to this new rule by disclosing um, this disclaimer ad by the highest ranked search results. So they are letting you know that someone paid to be placed so high in the um, search results. I have three comments here to make. The first one is that this new prohibition is not going to work on the practices of Netflix that I showed you before. Why? Because it only applies if the provider that um, gives you search results actually receives payment from other providers to prioritize their offers. Netflix uses ranking to um, change the way they provide you with their own services, and that is not yet prohibited, and there is no obligation to disclose that they are doing that. The second comment to make relates back to the question I asked at the beginning, um, do we think consumer protection measures are effective? Now, if you think about it, whether you would actually pay attention to this ad disclaimer here. Would you consider it to be working on you? Would you not click on the link? Would you, your friends, your family members actually hesitate to follow on that search result because you know it's an advertisement that it has been paid for? Only if you think that it would change impact your behavior, we can actually say that the consumer protection measure is effective, it's working. And the third comment to make here is we are not yet quite certain whether this prohibition will apply if the providers of digital services pay for their offers to be placed higher in search results by other means than monetary payment. What other means this could be? This could be data collection. So providing the digital service provider with uh, consumer data as a form of non-monetary payment. We only recently started seeing data collection as a form of payment in consumer protection uh, measures. And um, this is very common practice, especially for social media networks, which brings me to the case of Facebook. In 2020, German Federal Supreme Court examined practices of Facebook of collecting and processing data of their users on and off Facebook in order to provide them with more personalized services. What is the problem here? The problem is that 
Facebook didn't leave consumers a choice whether to agree to this additional data collection and to agree to then additional personalized services. Instead, you had a choice either to agree to this um, more invasive practice, more personalized services as a result, or quit Facebook services altogether, which can be quite difficult to do, to decide to quit cold turkey if you already have your whole uh, network of friends and family members there. The German Federal Supreme Court decided to condemn this practice as taking away the consumer choice. And um, I think this is actually a good decision because it um, pre prevents also Facebook from using more of persuasion profiling because let's be honest, they collect this data in order to use it against consumers in practices such as persuasion profiling. So that brings me to my recommendations, which we had two here. The first recommendation was that um, practices such as the ones employed by Facebook should be considered to be unfair commercial practices. That is, if a digital service provider ties services that could be provided separately, especially if this tying of services involves in collecting more data of consumers, that should mean that um, this practice should be seen as unfair commercial practice because it takes away consumers' choice and it does not account for the fact that consumers do not perceive um, payment by data as payment. They still think they are receiving a free service. The second point that I wanted to make here was that um, a term that allows digital service providers to collect data of consumers in the extent that is bigger, that exceeds the amount of data they need to actually provide the service should be considered to be an unfair term. Why? Because such terms, again, limit consumer choice and expose them to more persuasion profiling. Now, I hope you enjoyed this talk. If you are interested in this topic, you would like to know more about um, the practices of digital service providers and how we can protect consumers against these practices, look up our report. Thank you very much for your attention.